And now, this just in. Please welcome the hosts of MSNBC's Morning Joe, Joe Scarborough and Mika Brzezinski here with Atlantic's Jeffrey Goldberg. Welcome. Welcome to Late Morning Joe, which is much, for people who are on the show, that would be much preferable to the oh early God. morning yeah. that, we, that we do. Um, thank you uh, both for coming. Uh, Mika's going to be watching Twitter yeah. uh, I got it. Along, along the way to give us live updates. Um, so let's just, um, let's just jump, jump in um, to this extraordinary day. Joe, what does it all mean? Is this the beginning of the end? Is this just another, uh, another iteration in the endless drama? You're telling me to stay behind it? Yes. <laughs> you're, you're the one screaming, put him in cuffs, put him no, in cuffs. No, I'm not. Oh, I'm not. I mean, we um, only know what we have so far. Well, you know, I, I have no... That was I, not the time for discretion. I, uh, yeah, okay. We, we will not be discreet. No, you know, the other night when we first, uh, when all of this first broke, um, you had people on certain networks uh, trying to game out what the Senate was going to do before we even had an inquiry. So... We don't know what the Senate's going to do. We don't know where this goes, but I suspect uh, the information from this whistleblower's report is so damning, the Democrats are going to have no choice, I think, but to bring articles of impeachment, and they'll vote on him, and I think they'll impeach him. Not, not because it's a politically safe thing to do, but because it's the right thing to do. I don't think, if, if all of these facts uh, bear themselves out, then uh, I don't think they're gonna have any choice and because the number of people involved is so large, so expansive, you've got, uh, according to the complaint, 12 or so White House officials that were in on the call. And you have White House officials who then decided to take it offline and, and move it to another place, the, the contents of that conversation. You have the State Department who had been angry. Uh, since April that Rudy Giuliani was getting involved. You've got all of these different players. The, the net has been cast so wide that the possibility so the leaking of a, a has only cover just up, begun. It's just begun. And you already saw it yesterday. You saw the acting DNI leak something to the Washington Post or somebody close to him saying, hey, I was going to quit if they didn't let me testify. Pompeo started leaking against Giuliani. About 12 people threw Giuliani under the bus yesterday, backed up the bus, and threw him under again. That was before, before the report came Mika, out. Mika, um, you, you've read the whistleblower complaint. What struck you the most? Well, the, the cover-up, the potential for more that is in that separate computer system uh, that they you know, only use for very, very highly classified classified information where this stuff was apparently stuffed away, this conversation. We should step back 30 seconds because maybe you all haven't read the whistleblower complaint yet, or maybe you're all on your phones right now reading the whistleblower. Uh, I, your uh, Wi-Fi is really give, bad, Jeff. Give us, um, give us the, so give someone us, can get but me But we on. have really bright lights. <laughs> yeah. It's really nice. Um, but but give, give us the 30-second version of what you've understood from what you just read this uh, morning. You know, the president was shaking down the leader of Ukraine to get dirt on Joe Biden and uh, did it systematically over a period of time. There were multiple White House officials who were privy to these conversations. Um, Giuliani was sent over there or uh, to have conversations. I think some trips were canceled. We were hearing from um, sources in the State Department over the summer about this, that this was percolating. So, you know, it appears that those who might have heard about this or been in the room when this was happening were feeling uncomfortable in real time because we were getting tips about this throughout the summer. You obviously saw the president on national television say he would do this to George Stephanopoulos. And I think, you know, the big issue right now as we cover this story and we get into the next 24 hours, which I think are gonna be incredible, is this battle for the truth. And this presidency, like it or not, has devalued the truth, devalued the importance of a free press every step of the way. And I think a lot of people question now what's out there as a result. And you will still have people today on the Republican side, and I don't know how long this is gonna last, where they do not see what is in black and white. What was even released from the White House yesterday in that memo, they don't see any there there. They won't say publicly that there is anything there. How long is that going to last? I, I want to come back to the issue of the press because we've, we've spoken about this and, and, and how the press should handle the next days and, and weeks and months. But Joe, I want to just very quickly pivot to you. Um, you have experience in, in impeachment. In, in 98, you voted to impeach 
uh, President Clinton. Um, we, this morning on, on your show, we were talking about Ben Sass and how he, like Romney, has kind of dipped his toe in the water uh, just a bit. Uh, talk about the pressure on, on, on the Republican team to stay together, even though it's pretty obvious that any reading of this whistleblower complaint would say this is a serious national security concern. Well, you know, it's very interesting. Back, uh, what, 20 years ago when this was going on, the pressure was internal. So it was leadership saying you have to vote for impeachment on all four articles or else locusts will descend from the heavens and, you know, eat the flesh from your bones and the Republican Party will collapse. You are, you know, now... I, most of these people who are being loyal this week to Donald Trump uh, are feeling the pressure from home, feeling the pressure from social media. I still am just absolutely fascinated all these years later, and I really shouldn't be so naive, that people are afraid of a mean tweet from Donald Trump, that they are actually unwilling to do the right thing because they fear that Donald Trump is going to say something badly about them. I mean, but it's easy I, for you guys to say because you've been the subject of mean tweets for years now. Well, yeah, so. he. Well, it's, I was. Well, I was going to say he. So this is how we respond to mean tweets. I was accused of being a murderer by Donald Trump. I came home from work. I walked in, and at the time, my 14-year-old girl and my seven-year-old boy were there, and uh, they're just sitting up and staring at me. I said, "Hey, got a question for you guys." Uh, did anybody accuse you uh, of being a murderer today at school? Or has the President of the United States accused you of being a murderer? They, of course, broke out in laughter, and we sort of just, again, we've, every time he attacks us, we just shrug it off. But I'm, I find it remarkable that somebody that has given a voting card is actually concerned about a social like, media attack against him from so Donald much Trump. more about him every time he does that. It's, it's not... It doesn't hurt the person he's tweeted against. It says something well, about him. Well, it could. Let's, let's just say he goes after Ben Sass, senator from Nebraska uh -huh. today, who's yeah. up for re-election, is going to be, be primaried. Um, are you saying that, given, given Trump's popularity in the Republican base, that he can't do damage to Ben Sass's electoral challenge? I'm not making a moral well, question. This is a practical he, political he question. He can do damage, but he will do the most damage. And I found this time and again in politics. He can do the most damage if Ben Sass doesn't fight back. You can't go halfway. You ha it's it's kind of like after Sandy Hook. Uh, you know, I had been, as a member of Congress, I had been a pretty uh, consistent Second Amendment vote, uh, supporting Second Amendment rights. But I decided to go after the NRA after Sandy Hook and say, just absolutely enough, we need universal background checks military style. And I remember as I was uh, about to do it, Mika said, listen, if you're going to go after the NRA, go after the NRA. This, this can be nothing less than an all-out battle for what's right. That's the problem with Mark Sanford. People bring up Mark Sanford on why Sanford lost. Sanford lost because he was trying to have it both ways. If you're going to go after Donald Trump and you're Ben Sass, you have to say, I'll vote for him when his policies are right. But let's not kid ourselves. Donald Trump is a danger to the republic. Donald Trump has done one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And what I found is when you go to your constituents and hold dozens of town hall meetings and you explain why you're doing what you're doing, they always give you the benefit of the doubt. We ran Newt Gingrich out of out of Washington, D.C. when he was Speaker of the House. Nobody could understand him district-wide. I was part of the coup that got rid of Gingrich until I held about three dozen town hall meetings, and then I got 80% of the vote in the Republican primary the next election. Can, can, can I ask you one politics question? It's something that came up this morning also. The, uh, how does all of this affect Biden? Oh, go ahead. No, you think it's bad. You know, you think it's bad for him. I'm still holding on to yeah, hope. Yeah, Mika thinks it's, it's no, good for No, well, I just... Yeah, you explain. All right, well, this is probably wishful thinking. But I think that this puts Donald Trump and Joe Biden squarely against each other, which I think the Democratic candidates have all been trying to not make it about, you know, each other. You saw Kamala Harris make an attempt to do this in debate and to have that fight squarely with Donald Trump. 
I think that, you know, potentially the spotlight on Biden allows him then to engage on these issues of foreign policy and why it's critically important to know what you're doing, to have uh, experience like he does decades in the foreign policy realm. He actually knows the names of foreign leaders. And, you know, that, uh, that helps, you know, these days, apparently. I would venture to say that Donald Trump does not. You probably, if you asked him to name the leader of Ukraine or the past leader of Ukraine, he couldn't. Um, he might today, because he's reading Twitter. But, uh, so I, I think it allows Joe Biden to start talking about these issues head to head with Donald Trump's. So it's almost like they're debating right now. Having said that, you know, it's a very, very vulnerable area for Biden. I think his surviving son, I just think that everybody sort of doesn't want to go there. He, it has been investigated. It's not that necessarily. It's other familial issues that I think we all wouldn't want to delve into. Yeah, but you know, it's not a binary choice. It's not Joe Biden or Donald Trump. You can go with Elizabeth Warren. You can go with a lot of other people. I know Michael Bennett uh, was asked, would your vice president's son be allowed to do this? And he was like, no. I mean, the question remains, the question that hovers over, I'm sure a lot of Democratic primary voters is this. Why was Joe Biden's son in Ukraine getting $600,000 uh, when Joe Biden was trying to get, ri get, get rid of the investigator? Because, of course, the entire European community asked that question. It's just like Hillary Clinton giving $250,000 speeches to state universities that she represented when she was senator or to Goldman Sachs. Democrats have the choice. They can go with Elizabeth Warren, or they can go with Bernie Sanders, or they can go with one of the other 47 candidates. <laughs> and I think that I just I think this makes Biden look like part of the system, part of the problem, whether that's fair or not. It's very, very early in this particular scandal, but give me a prediction. Is this is this going to be materially different than Mueller? Is this is this a pivot point? I think it already is. I mean, but we haven't even had a vote to impeach yet. I mean, we haven't. It's even an incredible seen it. test for the media because I think the drumbeat and um, the build-up to the Mueller report, while the Mueller report revealed incredible things, I think the build-up didn't match the results and how the results were handled, and the upper hand the president had using his attorney general to to spin it, and it, in it's an interesting time now because. Like I said on the show this morning, and it wasn't a you know classy way of saying it, but it's like our our cat Meatball eats lizards, and we're like Meatball, did you eat a lizard? And he vomits one up. So you ask <laughs> the president, you know, did you shake goes, down? No, no, I did not. <laughs> and then you 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 ask the president, did you shake down the leader of UCAN? They release a, a memo that says, you know. I need a favor. And as Jeffrey says in the whistleblower report, it's all helpfully there. The crime and the cover-up, all in a quick eight-page read. Thanks to the White House. And, you know... Right, which is the strangest part it's of the this. the strangest part. And, and this goes to a larger question. Yes, there, there are a lot of Republicans who are looking at the White House and said, why did you let this out? I don't know. Like, what, yeah. and, 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 but it goes to this very large question. And you two know Donald Trump, and you've obviously been studying and watching for years. My question about him, and this is, I think, like the deepest cognitive question is, does he understand what he's doing moment to moment? In other words, when he's on that, does he have consciousness of guilt? Obviously, people around him, if, if, there, was, if there was indeed a cover-up, an attempt to hide this, the documentation of this call, then some people understood that it was wrong. My question about Donald Trump is always, does he, does he understand where the lines are, and does he understand how to adhere to the lines? He does not understand where the lines are. He does, at times, uh, understand strategy. Uh, but when he is under attack, he just reflexively pushes back, fights back, and he can't help himself. And he day trades with the truth in real time. Well, and he's constantly day trading. And the thing that he didn't understand, and I remember actually, I'm trying to remember what was the issue. Uh, was it Russia? forget. But one of the issues where I, where I think Jared was talking in, during the, because we didn't talk to him for most of the campaign, and then we started talking to him in the transition. And in the transition, 
It was the craziest, most bizarre stuff that was going on and flying off the walls. And I said to Jared, I said, Jared, you know, like, this isn't like real estate in New York. I had a brother who was a pretty good stockbroker, but he got out because a couple of his friends made technical errors and they got sent to jail. And he's like, I'm, no, I don't know this stuff enough. I said, you guys don't know what you don't know. And I think Donald Trump never bothered to know what he knew. And anybody that was ever around him that could warn him, he's made sure that they've been, you know, sent back, had their bags and were sent packing and, and left the White House. I so mean, he's in there alone with nobody around to, to guard him. And no guardrails on right. the truth or the value of it. I mean, he still thinks, as we're dealing with this Ukraine issue, if you look at him trying to answer questions about this, he's treating it like it's Rosie O'Donnell or something, you know, where he's like, yeah, when you see these transcripts, and there'll be these transcripts, you know, I hope you see the transcripts. Then someone says, are you saying there are transcripts and that you would like to release them? I never said that. That's within the course of 10 minutes. This is... He contains Donald, multitudes, as they say. He yeah, just, he just, but it's like how he played with the New York media when he was dealing with supermodels and pageant stars and Rosie O'Donnell and who his latest enemy of the day was. But so, unfortunately, this is our national security. So, so two final questions for you. One is you watch the, the, the press handle or, or not handle very well the rise of Trump. Um, and the first almost three years. Um, we're at the beginning of maybe the most consequential period. My question is, do you fear that we're gonna go too fast to make judgments, or we're gonna go too slow to make judgments, or we're going to, uh, we had a great piece by our, our Jim Fallows uh, over the weekend, warning against the kind of journalistic whataboutism. You know, Trump says Biden did this and Biden denies it. Well, there's no proof that Biden ever did anything. And so we, we, we worry about that. And then we worry about over hyping something that might not actually well, end the way you think you could talk about You could talk about the New York Times and the Kavanaugh story this past week. You can talk about what happened over the past summer where Democratic senators who were running during the Kavanaugh hearings were telling us, this is killing me at home. I think we have to be careful uh, but, you know, it's very interesting, you know, I've, I've been trying to write a book about Trump and the mistakes that we made uh, during 2015, the mistakes the media made. Uh, but as I've gone back, it's extraordinary. The patterns are actually very predictable, and I'm actually shocked that uh, the media and me, excluding you and the Atlantic, which is just the best Obviously. and the brightest, were, have, Perfect. Been too, Perfect. have been too stupid to pick this up. But you remember when Donald Trump attacked the Pope in South Carolina in 2016? There's so many and other things to remember. And you're sitting there and you're going, why in the world would anybody attack the Pope? Why would a politician? Do you know why? Because that was the day that Nikki Haley shocked everybody and it endorsed Marco Rubio. It is always about not the next day's headline, the next hour's headline. And he's constantly trying to distract the press. We constantly overreact. His people pick up on our excesses, even if they're small excesses. And I do think we need to be more careful. Like, for instance, the Biden report. So I just said in here something that I haven't said yet on television, but I will. And that is, why was Bo Biden there? The reason I haven't said Hunter, why, why was Hunter Biden there? And the reason I haven't said that yet is, because I know that will immediately be churned up and there'll be whataboutism. And by the way, for the record, the Wall Street Journal called it yesterday a discredited theory that Joe Biden fired a prosecutor to help his son. So the Wall Street Journal on the front page has already called it a discredited conspiracy theory or a discredited theory. So I do think we have to be careful about the whataboutism. And saying, well, yes, well, it's, it is true that Donald Trump uh, shook down a democracy that was being invaded by Vladimir Putin. And now let's turn and see what yeah. Hunter Biden did. I think we have to be careful there. He's just got to let the story speak for itself. What, one, one last thing. Can you imagine a situation now in which Donald Trump is reelected president? <laughs> you you want to say it or not? I, I'm going to tell you this. <laughs> Usually that so, hand motion means something. It's interesting because we were two of the only people that were saying he could win. 
in 2016. And we were crucified for saying that. And everybody gets shocked. And now, everybody that predicted he could never win under any circumstances are looking at this guy, and they think he has this magic pixie dust that he can just sprinkle on anything he wants to sprinkle, and he's going to magically win states that no Republican has won in the past 40 years other than him. He's a 40% president. When people kept freaking out about 2018, I said, he's a 40% president. That means 60% of Americans are not with him. So no, I don't, oh my God, you feel me? No, <laughs> he cannot be reelected. And if he is reelected, I just, I do not know what that says about a plurality of our country, because this guy is not only unfit to be president of the United States, he is a real, a, a present danger to this constitutional republic, and we cannot survive four more years of him. And we'll end on that, we'll end on that exciting note. Thank you very much, Joe thank and Mika. You. Thank you. Please thank them. Thanks, sir.